coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. I don't care how long you've been out there in the world. I don't care how long you've been in bondage. I don't care how much the church rejects you, hates you, despises you, talk about you. If God has called you to his eternal glory, when you come back to him, he's not going to say, now you've got to work your salvation out again, and you've got to word it, you got to earn my love. He does not. He comes and he says, look, it's one of my prodigal sons. It's my son, not my servant. It's my son. He does not see us as slaves. He sees us as sons. When are we going to start seeing ourselves as sons and daughters? Right? It's not too late, but it can get too late. I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for tuning in to Keys to Kingdom Living. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Docker. If you're new to this television ministry, I want to invite you to get out the Word of God because I do not give you my opinion. I do not editorialize. I just share what the Lord gives me out of the Word of God. Today we're bringing you a brand new word. It's entitled Protecting Your Spiritual Inheritance. We've got to know what Jesus says so that when the thief comes, we don't give place to the devil. I'm excited to share this word with you. Go with me and let's hear this message. So look with me there in Luke chapter 15. Let's talk about protecting our spiritual inheritance as Christians. Now, Luke 15, beginning with verse 11, is a very familiar uh, story in uh, the Gospels. It's about the prodigal son. And we see here in verse 11, then Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, this younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal uh, living, or riotous living, one version says. And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he, set, he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly have eaten or filled his stomachs with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave anything or gave him anything. But when he came to himself, or when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the hired servants. So he arose, came to his father, but when uh, he saw, he, or while he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, the father said to his servants, highlight that, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be married. For this my son, my son, I like that, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now, this is the second word from the Lord on the subject of a believer's uh, inheritance. Sinners don't have an inheritance because they love the world and live for themselves. If they die in their sins, as Scripture tells us in John, their future only holds torment and unspeakable anguish for them for all of eternity. Now, despite the truth concerning where sinners will spend eternity, millions of people choose to ignore the truth and live for the temporal pleasures of this world. That's how susceptible people are in this life to the God of this world who blinds those who do not believe in the gospel of Christ. Think about that. 
living for the moment rather being concerned about where their soul will spend all of eternity. Eternity, it's hard for us to fathom eternity because we're finite beings. We had a beginning and we will have an end. So it's hard for us to grasp, get our minds around eternity. Eternity will never end. People in torment, they will never know life without torment for all of eternity. After billions and billions and billions of years, if time was even counted, which it is not, because the Bible says in Revelation, time will be no more. But even after that, after billions and billions of years, it would only be a, a microcosm of time, and you're still there, never being able to escape the, the fires of torment. And yet people gamble their soul's eternity for the pleasures of this world, which are but for a moment. The pull of this world is tremendous on our soul, even as Christians. We still battle with our flesh. We still battle with lust. We still battle with, with desires that, that try to distract us and detract us and derail us from the calling that God has set for our lives. He has predetermined in advance things that we are to do as Christians. This is why we must be willing as Christians to crucify the lust of our flesh and to live for God so that we can have strength to resist the allure of this world. If we as Christians do not take up our cross, which is the ability to crucify our own flesh so that we can live for God, how are we going to have the strength to resist the temptations and the allure of the world when they hit us? Because the, the things of this world pulls on that flesh nature. And that thing should be crucified with Christ, right? But if a believer should decide they had rather indulge themselves in prodigal or riotous living as this son did, know they're allowing Satan to rob them of their inheritance, both in this life and in the life to come. I'm going to give you scripture, back all this up. Now, I assure you that none of us has acquired all that God has in store for us. This ain't all that God's got for us, y'all. I'm tired of us living off the peelings when God says, I've got fruit that you don't even know about. We've got to make that transition into the Spirit because it is the Spirit that receives. The flesh profits nothing. If we're walking around as Christians in the flesh all the time, how are we going to walk in our spiritual uh, inheritance in this life? How are we going to receive the riches of His glory when He says, my, flesh, my glory will I share with no man? We've got to die to self so that the spirit man can come forth and we can start inheriting what God has for us. Did he not say in the word, I have given you dominion over all things? Did he not tell us in Luke 10, 18 and 19, behold, I give you authority over all the powers of the enemy? Did he not tell Adam and we are in Adam that he has given us dominion over all the earth? Did he not come back in Deuteronomy 28 and tell us, I have made you to be the head and not the tail above only and not beneath the first and not the last does not God want us to walk in authority so why is it that we as Christians don't seem to know who we are in Christ when the world comes against us you come against me with a spear and a sword but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts today my God will deliver you into my hands and all the world will know that I serve the living God where is the authority that we as Christians should walk in why do we walk in fear when God has not given us a spirit of fear but a power, love, and a sound mind. This is just the intro. Calm down. We have not acquired all that God has uh, apprehended us for. Even Paul talks about that in Philippians 3.12, does he not? Paul himself desired and pressed after that for which Christ had apprehended him for. So let me ask you this question. What are you striving for in your life? Are you pursuing the things of this world more than the things of God? Jesus instructs us as his disciples to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to us. Don't pursue things as Christians. They are to follow us as we seek God. Put things first, first things first, right? 
Let Jesus be your first love, and he will bless you with what you need to be blessed with. If he's not going to give it to you and you go after it, it's not going to be a blessing. It's going to be a curse. It's going to be a bondage. Whether it's a relationship or a job or a car, if God says you can't have it yet, there's a reason why. He's not keeping it from you. He's keeping it for you. Now, Jesus said the boy was a prodigal. He, or he went out and spent his wealth, his inheritance, if you will, on prodigal living. From the def definition of prodigal or riotous living, we gain a better understanding of what happened to this wayward son who demanded his inheritance from his father. He said, Father, give me the goods that belong to me. Riotous in the Greek means dissolute. Dissolute means lacking restraint. What does Proverbs talk about when people don't have a vision? They cast off restraint. They per my people perish when there is no vision. So uh, when, when we don't have a vision, a clear vision, a clear word and direction from God, we cast off restraint. Well, this boy left his ha uh, father's house, and when he did, he, he, he was in prodigal living. He lacked restraint. You'll catch up here in a minute. By the definition of the word that Jesus used to describe this son, he was somewhat sheltered and perhaps spoiled by his father because when he left the protection and the instruction of his father, he couldn't handle money or control his lust. I mean, think about it. We have no idea how much wealth this father gave his son. Obviously, he, this father had a lot of wealth, and he divided all his wealth up between the two sons, and he went ahead and gave his prodigal the part that lies to him, right? Let's say, for, well, it was a lot. So he goes out, and, and he has no self-control because he's been under his daddy's house. Well, you just wait till I get out of my parents' house. I'll show them. And they go out, and they fall flat on their face. That's what this boy did. I'm tired of living under your house. Give me what belongs to me. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do it my way. And when he did, what happened? Here's what happened. The world drained him of his riches, robbed him of his inheritance, and reduced him down to nothing more than a slave to sin. The world did that. While he was in his father's house, he had everything that he had need of. Right? But he, when he went out into the world, out from under his father's covering, out from under his father's authority, out from under his father's uh, protection, the world drained him because he did not know how to resist the world. No wonder this generation is, is falling all over the place. We have not prepared our sons and daughters for the generation, for this this evil the depraved world that we're sending them out into no wonder college students university students are being devoured up by the the philosophy and the ideology of college professors and they're coming out not knowing what gender they are anymore you, you're not preparing your children with the word of God so they have a foundation and they know who they are in Christ Jesus. So when they get into college and somebody that has influence tells them, you don't know what you are. So we're going to explain to you who you are. And it tears them down. And that's what the world did to this prodigal. It tore him down to the point he said, I am no longer worthy to be called a son. I'll be a slave. That's what sin does to us. It demoralizes us. Makes us feel like we're not children. We're just slaves. We're just servants. Now, does this sound to you like any way to live? It doesn't. When you peel the, the pretty surface off of sin, which that's the pleasures of sin, when you peel all that away, all you have is death. And once you look at the death of sin, it doesn't have any appealing to it at all. Right? So why are countless children from Christians, Christian homes choosing the same path for their lives instead of serving the, the Lord? 
Where's the millennial generation in church? It's hard to reach the 20-somethings. This is not just in this area. This is across America. This generation is missing in the church. Why are we losing this generation? What appeal does the world have that the church can't seem to get a hold of so that they can reach this generation that's coming up? When we know what the truth says, the wages of sin is death. But so many are going after it, are they not? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please, and let's go a little bit deeper. First Corinthians 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, Paul writes, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on that foundation. So you're giving a, been given a foundation in Christ Jesus, but then you've got to choose how you're going to live your life as a Christian, right? Take heed how you build on that foundation, Christ Jesus. For no other foundation can, be, can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, hay, wood, or straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, capital D, which is judgment, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So how you choose your life will be uh, to live your life will be uh, revealed on the day of judgment, where you stand as a Christian before the judgment seat of Christ, right? And you give an account for the, time, the things that you did here on earth. And the fire in his eyes is going to reveal what sort of work you did. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will what? He'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. But watch this, as though with fire or through fire do you not know that you are the temple of god christians and that the spirit of god dwells in you if anyone defiles the temple of god god will what is that still truth today so why aren't people acting like it for the temple of god is holy which temple you are now i want to speak only to believers for a moment on the subject of rewards James tells us in his epistle that God will reward those who choose to endure temptation instead of entering it by giving those who love him a crown of life when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He is going to reward us with a crown of life, right? Christians will receive rewards for the good things that we've done, the obedient things we've done, right? Likewise, Paul also teaches us that God will reward only those believers who live the life that he has ordained for them to live on this earth once we all get to heaven. Now, but Paul also teaches us that if we build a life simply for the pleasures of self, then we will lose our reward. There it is, plain and simple. This is different than our spiritual inheritance. These are rewards for obedience, right? Spiritual inheritance is what I said a while ago. It's when we become uh, spirit beings and we're led by the Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of, of God, these are the what? What if you're not led by the Spirit of God? What if you're letting the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and pride of life in your own thing dictate your life? What are you then? Your child. Right? Not a son. You're a child. Now, we've got to get to the place, and God says we've got to get there quickly, where we are ready to receive our inheritance so that we can walk in it, so that this world can be changed. Right? That is why I wanted to make a distinction between reward and inheritance. Paul concludes his teaching in the passages we just read saying, if any man defiles the temple, any woman, any uh, young woman, young child, young girl, young boy, if anyone defiles the temple, their body, that God will destroy him or her, this is not a game. I, I remember Charlie Sheen. 
Charlie Sheen used to be the top of his field. He used to have people wanting him in their movies. And then he got into drugs. He got into uh, behavior. And it has cost him almost his life. They showed a picture of him recently, and he looks like he's about 75 or 80 years old. He's almost uh, unrecognizable. This is what happens when we treat the temple of God that's supposed to be holy with contentment and go out and live in, in sin and riotous living, right? It's not a game, y'all. Young people, this is not a game. You will pay a price for the sins that you commit with your soul. Take note that the, take note that the parable of the prodigal dealt with the son and with his father. That's why I said highlight these. It dealt with the son, right? This is a story or an illustration of a believer that chooses to no longer live for or serve the Lord so they can live their life for the pleasures of their flesh. That's what, it's, that's what this story is about. God, I don't want anything else to do with you. Just give me what riches I've got and let me go do what I want to do. And the world bankrupts them. And they're not walking in their inheritance no more. No longer. Now, turn with me to uh, Galatians chapter 4. Let's take it a little deeper. <clears throat> line upon line, precept upon precept, right? Paul's writing to the Jews at uh, Galatia, the believers. And he says this, Now I say that the heir... As long as he is a what? A child does not differ at all from a slave. This is Paul under the direction, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing. Right? He says as long as uh, he is a child, as long as she is a child, they differ nothing, nothing at all from a slave or a servant, though he is master of all. Get this in, in your spirit because God's about to release some, some things in your life that it's like, wow, how did I not see that before? But once you get to know what I'm about to share with you, you're going to be responsible to walk in it. So if you don't want to hear it, just do this. <laughs> this I say, that the heir, as long as his child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he be master of all. He's master of all, right? It reminds me of Simba in Lion King. Whenever he was a little bitty uh, uh, kitten, if you will, his father was the king of the, the jungle. He was the Lion King. Mufasa was powerful. When he roared, the hyenas shivered with fear. And so Simba, his son, gets up and says, well, I can do that. And he goes, war, 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 meow. And it didn't intimidate anybody. But he was, a, he was a child, right? He was an heir, right? He was the heir to the throne to become Lion King, right? But he didn't differ at all from a servant. So what did Simba need to do? Grow up. Y'all got it. Now, He is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Don Clower, Pastor Don Clowers is a very good friend of our family. Dad, Daddy and he go back long ways. And they worked together for a while. And uh, whenever Pastor Don uh, was out traveling, he met a, a young woman that God had called to ministry. And she was in, in this place, this church, and uh, she was fired up because she knew she had had words spoken over. She would be a minister of the gospel, and she'd travel all over. And, and so uh, she was ready to go. She was ambitious. She wanted. She was chomping at the bit. She, she's told us many times over her television and radio ministry, she, does, she lacks patience still today after 40 years. And she kept telling Pastor Don, says, I'm ready to go. She sa he says, no, you're not. She sa he says, until you can treat those that are over you with respect, you won't get it either. 
And that woman is Joyce Meyer. He mentored her. They have a real close relationship. And she was placed under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. There comes a time in, in every Jewish boy's life where they reach manhood, where they come out from under their mother's uh, apron strings, and their father takes them into the family business. What did Jesus say when, when his mother was wanting him to do things? He says, I must be about my father's business. God had said, it's, it's the appointed time, Jesus. You've got to come into my business. And he was taking over the family business. That's the way it is with Jewish men. When they came of age, they worked with their father up to a certain age when they were adults. And then at the time appointed by the father, they were given the business. You see that? Though we're children and we're heirs, we differ nothing from slaves or servants, the Bible says. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. And when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive, here it comes, the adoption as children. That's not what it says. The adoption as sons, and because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ Jesus. Are you getting this now? But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those things which by nature that are not God's. So there's that war that, that our nature wants to go serve something that is not God's when God says, I've called you to serve me, the living God, and be my son or my daughter, right? We're almost out of time today, but before I leave you, I want to encourage you, contact the church office or email us and let us know how God is touching your life through this ministry. You'd be amazed at how little people reach out to the television ministries around the world and let them know what the word is doing, what the songs are doing to their lives to help them and impact them. We would love to hear from you. It would encourage us and help us hold our arms up on your behalf. Would you do that? You can contact us either email or, you, or through the church office by phone. The information will be at the bottom of the screen. And always, I love to give opportunity. If you have any prayer requests or praise reports, send those in as well through email or you can call the church office for that. And then finally, whatever is going on in your life, I want to encourage you. Look to the Lord. Put your eyes on Him because He will strengthen you with might and inner man and He will steal you with that calm voice through the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to do that. Someone's in turmoil today. I sense it by the Spirit. That's why He stopped me. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you today. And be still and know that he is God. Okay? Till this time next week, this is Pastor Asa thanking you for joining us. God bless you.